Science Headliners. Please welcome our host from Linda Hall Library, Vice President for Public Programs, Eric Ward. Dr. Timothy Mousseau is Professor of Biological Sciences at the University of South Carolina. For over two decades, his research has focused on the effects of radiation and other contaminants on organisms living in Chernobyl, Ukraine, Fukushima, Japan, and other radioactive regions of the world. Dr. Mousseau, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. Hey, Eric, pleasure to be here. For those who may not remember, what happened in Chernobyl, Ukraine in 1986? Well, you know, <laughs> given current world events and uh, the, the recent HBO series uh, from a couple of years ago, just about everyone is now familiar with the fact that there was a major meltdown uh, and explosion and sort of uncontrolled nuclear fission and, 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 and a fire all combined at, at, at the same time which released uh, uh, on April 26, 1986 is when it started. And uh, this nuclear fire burned for 10 days and, and this, this, this catastrophic meltdown of the, of the power plant released absolutely un enormous quantities of radioactivity. Uh, it, was, it was injected into the atmosphere. The fire was burning so hot that, that the, uh, the, you know, this, this radioactive materials were, were injected and spread far and wide, basically across most of Europe, in fact. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's still radioactive in many areas to this day. And, and, and so we're still dealing with, with this, uh, this, this catastrophe at, 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 even now. And you have been researching the effects of that radiation on wildlife in the region since 1999 or 2000, correct? That's right. Yeah, my first, my first visit to the site was in 1999 as part of a, a faculty exchange program, uh, and, you know, intended to, to kickstart uh, you know, in interactions between the United States and former Soviet uh, republics. And, uh, but our first real research visit was in 2000, uh, where we, when we started catching birds and <laughs> looking, looking at them to see how they were faring uh, under conditions of, you know, substantial radioactivity. And wh what have you found there? H have there been mutations? Have, um, what have the effects been of that radiation? So we essentially found everything you might expect for radiation to do to uh, living organisms, starting first with uh, damage to the DNA, leading to increased mutation rates and, and, and various other kinds of deleterious effects on, on the genetic composition of these organisms. But we've also found uh, the consequences of, of this genetic damage, uh, such as you know, tumors, increased rates of tumors in, in organisms in the more radioactive areas. We also found that uh, they have... Uh, you know, the birds and, and the small mammals have increased rates of cataract in their eyes, and they also have smaller brains as a result of radiation effects on neurological development. Uh, it, from, from an e ecological standpoint, maybe from an evolutionary standpoint, uh, the, the most striking consequence has been reduced abundances, reduced numbers of organisms, as well as reduced biodiversity in these areas of, of high radiation. So none, none of the effects are, you know, unknown. We haven't discovered any new effect of radiation. Uh, these are all, you know, effects that have been reported in the literature for, for, you know, experimental studies. But this is the first, many of these studies were the first time to report uh, these kinds of consequences for wild organisms living in nature, as it were, even, even a highly contaminated nature. How big is the area at Chernobyl, uh, the, the exclusion area? What are we so, talking about then? Yeah, the, the exclusion area itself is, is uh, about 2,000 square kilometers, so whatever that is, one point uh, over 1,000 square miles, basically. And so it's a very large area. It's, 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 it's not circular, but you know, it sort of spans across 30 miles, uh, you know, around the old power plant. Uh, parts of it are, are in Ukraine and other parts are in, in, in Belarus, which is right on the border uh, with uh, Ukraine there, uh, where the power plant is. Uh, and so it's a pretty vast area that was put inside this exclusion zone. But, of course, many other parts of, of Eastern Europe, especially, were, were significantly contaminated uh, by Chernobyl, as was uh, much of Scandinavia, large swaths of Scandinavia were affected from the fallout. 
Uh, and so it wasn't limited to this exclusion zone. This was just the area of highest contamination where people were, were kept out. Will these radiation effects uh, among the wildlife have a generational impact through evolution or will it eventually, or will these effects eventually fade over time? You know, that's a, that's a really important question. And it, it really has been, uh, you know, at the sort of the foundation of, of our interest in this area. I'm, I'm by training an evolutionary biologist and, and our primary interest has been to determine the extent to which these mutations that we know are accruing in these natural populations, the extent to which these mutations can be transmitted to the next generation through the germline, through the sperm and the eggs, and, 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 and as a consequence, perhaps can actually magnify or accumulate over multiple generations so that the effects are even larger you know, generations down the line. And uh, you know, from population genetics theory, we know that this kind of effect can happen uh, and that there can be these uh, long-term deleterious effects that, that can even push a given population uh, to, to local extinction as a result of the, the negative effects of these mutations. Uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, there, but there's also the other sort of the flip side of the coin, which is this radiation is providing selection, natural, unnatural selection mm -hmm. for individuals to be and populations to be resistant to the effects of, of this radiation. Um, and, and, you know, the effects of the radiation are complicated. They're not just, you know, simple damage to the DNA. There are other consequences of this interaction. And, uh, uh, and, and so there's this constant pressure for species to get better at dealing with this. Um, you know, essentially the individuals that, that do better are more likely to survive and reproduce. And, 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 and if there's a genetic basis to this resistance or tolerance or you know, whatever it is that gives them an advantage, uh, then this will be passed on to the next generation. So there could be some sort of positive response to this pressure. And, and this is one of the areas that we're very interested in. And, 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 uh, and, and of course, is uh, a, a, a topic of interest for, for NASA, for instance. And, and, uh, and Elon Musk and others who want to uh, spread the human species beyond Earth into, into space and, and onto Mars initially, uh, where we're going to have to grow plants, for instance, uh, to feed ourselves, and uh, as well as come up with mechanisms to defend ourselves against what is a very, very radioactive uh, place. Um, you know, most of the most of, most of the universe is extremely radioactive, much more radioactive than it is here on the surface of the planet where we're largely protected from radiation as a result of the Earth's atmosphere and as a result of the Earth's magnetosphere, which deflects most of this cosmic radiation. You mentioned plants. Have you seen the effects of radiation on plants in the Chernobyl region? We, we certainly have seen many effects of, of, of radiation on plants. The, uh, one of the, the first studies we did was to look at the pollen of over 100 different species and found that pollen germination or pollen viability was dramatically lower uh, for the individuals that were in the more radioactive parts of the zone. They, clearly the pollen DNA and other metabolic machinery had been damaged as a result of exposure to the radiation. This was also reflected in germination rates. Uh, uh, you know, the seeds produced by these plants in the more radioactive areas were less likely to germinate, uh, perhaps as a result of the damaged pollen. You know, without viable, healthy pollen, the seeds are unlikely to, to grow properly as well. And we've also detected you know, differences in growth rates and, and, and as well as the sort of shape and size of the leaves. Uh, there's been many other studies looking at, you know, the DNA of these plants showing damage to the DNA, as well as damage to the growing tips leading to very strange looking trees in these areas. There's, yeah, there's a, yeah, it, you know, again, it's, you know, none of this is really particularly surprising given what we know about radiation. What's surprising is that 
people have not studied it more <laughs> in the past 30 years. Yeah, and, and it's been around, and radioactive sites have been around now for uh, 80 years or so. 1945, yeah, it was, yep. you know, in terms of atomic bombs, yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you know now about what's happening at Chernobyl? Of course, it's in the middle of a war zone. Uh, have you uh, been in contact with colleagues in Ukraine or uh, what can you tell us about what's going on today? And I guess along with that, what's your biggest fear of what might happen? Indeed, the, you know, Ukraine is, is a war zone now. And, and as, a, as a consequence, all of the nuclear power plants, including Chernobyl, are potential targets, uh, either you know uh, intentionally or unintentionally, of, of this conflict, and certainly uh, it is uh, an incredibly dangerous situation for the world as a whole uh, to have this these kinds of industrial complexes in the crosshairs of of uh, military conflict, and, and and you know we we know from Chernobyl uh, that uh, you know and and, and Fukushima. <laughs> and prior to that, Three Mile Island, that the, uh, the, the potential health and environmental consequences of these kinds of accidents is, is, is very serious, potentially very serious. Uh, there have been, uh, you know, again, the, the numbers are, are, you know, <laughs> a little bit up in the air, but, prop, you know, on the order of hundreds of thousands of people that were directly or indirectly affected by the Chernobyl disaster, uh, through either loss of life or shortening of life or, or significant impacts on quality of life. And uh, we know from uh, studies of the Chernobyl zone that the, the environment as a whole is dramatically impacted in a negative way. And so, uh, you know, right at this point in time, based on what I've heard from, from my colleagues and from other news reports, the, the Chernobyl site itself is probably not uh, in imminent danger from, say, the loss of power to the cooling uh, pools, which has been in the news a lot this past week. The, and, and this is because the spent fuel rods that are being cooled in these pools are more than 22 years old, uh, which was when the last operating plant was shut down at, at, the, at the Chernobyl site. Many people don't realize that uh, the reactors at the Chernobyl site, there were four operating reactors at the time, and, uh, and, and, and two of them, uh, several of them uh, continue to 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 produce electricity and operate even after the the accident in 1986. <laughs> and so, uh, there's a that. yeah, the last one wasn't closed until 2000, and it was uh, you know and so as a consequence, uh, there there have been there's a there's a massive amount of of spent fuel sitting there, but but because it's so old, because it's been sitting in these cooling pools for 22 years at least. Uh, the uh, the likelihood of of, of a of a meltdown of any sort is, is 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 much much lower than it is for the other operating nuclear power plants in Ukraine, which are also in the crosshairs, that are also potentially the targets of military activity, and 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 as a consequence, are uh, much more likely to to you know to be the source of a major environmental and and, and health disaster and, and and you know we've never faced this this kind of situation before in our history uh, you know the uh, nuclear nuclear technology has been relatively guarded uh, <laughs> and, uh, and you know we've only we have only allowed seemingly stable uh, nations to to engage in this kind of technology and uh, although with a few exceptions eh? uh, but uh, uh, but certainly, this this is uh, this is an existential threat to, to humanity uh, in, in the making. Well, I hope their nuclear plants make it through this crisis safe and sound. All right, now it's time for my final three questions. Uh, just give me kind of your first the first thought that comes to mind. Uh, question number one: I saw on your CV that you're a scuba certified diver. What's what's your favorite, uh, or where is your favorite dive location? Oh well, you know, someplace warm. <laughs> the, uh, you know, the uh, I started off diving uh, as part of my uh, graduate work, uh, collecting fish from the bottom of deep, deep, dark, very cold lakes in Canada, and you know, which required uh, you know dry suits and diving at night and under the ice, 
and uh, which I loved at the time. But uh, in these days, you know, diving in, in Hawaii or the Cayman Islands or off the coast of Belize, uh, you know, the, these tropical coral reefs are absolutely amazing places to go, whether, whether you're in scuba or snorkel, uh, you know, being able to interface, at, you know, within that, in three dimensions in that aquatic world is, is uh, really, really, really rewarding. Just love it. That sounds nice to be at one of those locations now. Have you been to, uh, question number two, have you been to Bikini Atoll and some of those uh, nuclear uh, detonation sites from the 40s and 50s? So in our last major trip uh, before the COVID pandemic hit in, in, in January of 2020, in fact, we visited the Marshall Islands, uh, which was the site of 67 atomic bomb tests uh, between the 40s and 50s and uh, in the 40s and 50s and uh, we uh, we actually conducted a little uh, study uh, related to the animals living in currently living in the Marshall Islands uh, the, the dogs in particular uh, where we have been uh, attempting to uh, examine the DNA of these the animals that were around during this atomic bomb testing era uh, and, and we're hoping to determine if there is some sort of signature of the exposure to, to this radiation. Uh, we also have been looking at dogs in Chernobyl uh, for the same reason. And so we're hoping to compare the two to determine whether, again, there are signatures of exposure to, to radiation that, that are maintained in, in the DNA across multiple generations. Uh, I've not yet been to the Bikini Atoll. Uh, this is on my this is on my bucket list. <laughs> I've, it, uh, I've, I, I've read where it's a, a great diving location, despite all you know, of the nuclear tests. And... Yeah, that whole area, you know, again, is, is just spectacular. And, and, and these are some of the most beautiful places on the planet. Uh, what did strike me uh, during my visit to the Marshall Islands was that no matter how remote you are, and, and the Marshall Islands are extremely remote, which is why they were chosen for this step site, this, this test site area, they are littered with pollution, pl bits of plastic, you know, bits oh, of wow. shoes and bottles. You know, again, a thousand miles in the middle of the ocean from the, you know, from the nearest major population, and the garbage literally piles up on, on, on the shoreline from you know, places thousands of miles away. And, and that, was, uh, that was sort of the first time for me that, you know, it really, really hit home hard how big an impact we've had, especially in the last 30 or 40 years uh, on the planet. We really are in the age of the Anthropocene, uh, which I would suggest started with the first atomic bomb detonations in, the in 1945, which was the sort of point in our history where uh, the planet became completely and totally vulnerable to our actions. And, uh, and we're certainly seeing those, those consequences these days with climate change, you know, yeah. pollution, and, and, uh, and radiation. Definitely. All right, my final question. Uh, when tourism gets going once again in Ukraine, mm -hmm. in Ukraine and we get past this crisis, what's a uh, Number one recommendation for a tourist visiting Ukraine. Do you have a favorite restaurant, food, or a sightseeing place to visit? What would you recommend? You know, uh, Kiev, Kiev is, you know, the, the sort of the cultural center for this part of the world and has been for a long time, centuries. And uh, just walking through the old part of Kiev is, is, is a really special experience. And, and, and there, you know, again, like any large European city, there are literally thousands of restaurants and cafes and, you know, entertainment venues and, and uh, churches and, you know, and, uh, and museums. It, it's just a really, really special place and it's, and it's beautiful. Uh, and I just hope that there's something left of it by the time this conflict ends. I hope so too. I think we all hope so. But Dr. Marceau, thank you so much for taking the time today to join me. It's been a fascinating discussion and I look forward to following your research in the months and years to come. Thanks, for much. Thanks so much for having me here.